is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. We've been memorizing Psalm 27 in alignment with Ezra and Nehemiah where they are going through this time of exile, being uh, punished for their sinful state and disobeying the commands of God as we have seen as we'll see even today. Nehemiah quote from Deuteronomy and Psalm 27 helps us to see as even Nehemiah today does that even in our anguish, even in our exile, even in our suffering, we can find hope and claiming the promises of God. I'd like to read Nehemiah chapter 1 to us this morning. Would you hear God's word? The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the heavens, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, we are so delighted that you hear our cries, that we can invoke your name and cry out to you, And when it seems as though the heavens only rebound our words, 
you are not far from us. Though it may seem as though you are so distant, God, it is our disobedience, it is our wickedness, it is our sins that keep us from you. It is not the problem that the city is destroyed and the walls are breached. The problem is our sin first and foremost. That we have disobeyed a holy and good God. Lord, I pray that we would never take for granted the severity of disobeying you. The severity of turning our back upon your word that you have spoken so very clear to us. God, you are right to discipline us as your children. You would not be loving to us if you didn't when we turn our back from you. And so we beg of you your mercy that you would draw us to yourself and that you would show us the joy that there is in following you and knowing you. Oh God, we bring before you this morning our request and our prayer. And we ask especially this morning, Father, that you would continue to be with the many that we've been praying for for several weeks and months now. We think especially this morning of Katie Stubblefield. We ask, God, that you would continue to help her. She recovers and heals from her face transplant. Lord, would your mercy be upon her and give her back her sight, give her, her tongue, the usage of it, and that she would be able to speak. Lord, we pray this morning as well for our brother John Turner. Would you be with him? May we be a comfort. And what a joy it is how you have used so many of us to go visit with him in his days that he has before he goes to be with you. Lord, we also pray this morning for um, Michael Molinero's dad, that you would be merciful, that you'd continue recovery, though it may be slow to happen. Watch over him, we pray. Keep him from stroking again. And we just praise you for hearing our prayers and answering them. And we thank you, God, that we have the privilege to come and cry out to you, and that you do hear us. We have one request this morning, and that is that your spirit would rest upon your word and bring it alive into our lives that it may change and transform us. Cause us to be people that come before you and cry out to you and pray. And Lord, I ask that we would know the joy of Christ this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Children through fourth grade, you're dismissed at this time for Children's Church. We are celebrating today, in addition to recognizing, um, as we do every Sunday, we recognize the fatherhood of God that He has sent to us His Son, and that His Son has blessed us with the Spirit, and the three-in-one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are ours to know. Aren't you glad for that? That God is knowable. He is not distant. He has not hidden Himself from us. It is our sin that hides us from Him. It is our wickedness that causes us to be blind. One of the things that we have the privilege of is also just recognizing the joy that we have as men, as God calls upon us to be fathers and to be a reflection of our Heavenly Father above. And I just want to encourage us as men that we would continue to recognize the joy that we have as we have been loved by God to love one another and love those that have been placed into our families, that they would be our beloved. And our children would hear as even Jesus himself heard, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I want to encourage us that we would see ourselves much like we'll see today in Nehemiah. Men that will stand up in spite of the society around them and all the, the difficulties and dilemmas and the destruction as we'll see in Nehemiah. And that we will be men that will be godly and will live in the love of God and will lead as Nehemiah is going to be leading. 
We have come now to the second part of Ezra Nehemiah. We come to Nehemiah 1. And now our main character has changed. We have gone from having Ezra as our main character. And even if Ezra is the scribe that is continuing to write this down, some think that it is Ezra, some think that Nehemiah has now begun to write. And hence, that's probably why we have the distinction of Ezra and Nehemiah before us. But Nehemiah now is being entered into the game. Ezra has ended about 458 BC, if that helps you to keep in mind what's going on. And Nehemiah would be like the sequel movie that after a dozen years would come out afterward and say, this is the rest of the story. This is what's taking place. And there's been about 13 years go by. And we're in the year 445 BC in the reign of Artaxerxes, as we see in uh, Nehemiah 1. In fact, it's not July or June. It is Kislev, which is the month that we usually see as November slash December, somewhere in there. And so it's the winter of the year, and so they find themselves at, at the southern capital, uh, the winter place to stay for the kings. And Artaxerxes is still the king as he was at the end of Ezra. And they're at Susa, the capital. And one of Nehemiah's brothers comes with men from Judah. I want to point out something here so that we can have an appreciation of when does this name Jew come into the picture? Because up to this point we've had through the Old Testament the name of children of Israel. Now if you notice with me in verse number 2, and he says, I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. Remember that this uh, people had been called up at this point the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob. And now they have been diminished, as we have seen, down to just two tribes. There is the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. And so they take the name Jude or Judah and make that to be now where we get the word Jew or Jewish from. And so here we begin to see now a diminished, and he's asking and saying, how are my brothers doing there? What's going on? And he finds out that the people that have been in exile, that have been let out, which we see has been on just a little over 50,000 people, are in duress again. They have survived the exile, but it's been in great trouble and shame. And even though the temple has been rebuilt, the wall of the city is in ruins And every gate that is supposed to keep out those who are not to be there has been destroyed by fire. I'm not certain if Nehemiah, I doubt it, had ever been to Jerusalem before. But the thing that would have taken place at this time and one of the things that we need to appreciate about the Jewish people themselves is they are a people of history. They are a people who do not forget They are a people who have remained a people even without a homeland. They're the only people group, and this is under the hand of God, that have retained a heritage without having a homeland. Every other nation, once they lose a homeland, once they lose a national entity of land, they have become scattered within a few generations. But the Jewish people have retained their identity and they have done that throughout time. And as they're, as they're coming into this, this time here in Nehemiah, the thing that is taking place is they are not forgetting, even though Nehemiah may have never seen Jerusalem himself, he has heard the stories. Let me point you to a psalm, and would you turn there with me? Psalm 137. Just turn ahead a couple books. Psalm 137, because you will find now as you have gone through Ezra and Nehemiah, there are many of these psalms that come now with this lament like that we have read today is, how long will you forget us? How long will you, you punish us? This is coming out of this time of exile in, in particular. And Psalm 137 is a psalm that they wrote on the way to Babylon. Let me just read you a couple verses of it. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Zion is their word for Jerusalem. 
on the willows there, we hung up our lyres, we hung up our guitars, we hung up our harps. For there are captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. This is an imprecatory psalm and it's going to get wicked. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, let it bear Lay it bare, lay it bare down to its foundation, so daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Blessed shall be he who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. And all that sounds cruel. Do you see how they are not a forgetful people? Nehemiah would know the stories of Jerusalem. Nehemiah would know extensively of it. And when he hears that the city lies in ruins, when he hears that the walls are destroyed, when he hears there's not even a gate to close upon any of the gateposts, I want you to see what he does. I want you to see what he does when you and I come to this point where everything seems as though it's desperate. I usually don't do this, but I'm going to today. My son, Ben, was watching TV this week, and he was having, um, as the comic that he is, having fun with some of the Christian TV. Um, I can't remember what night and what time it was, but this guy gets on and starts to talk because he's in a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel context that, you know, everything has been, what do you do when you've preached health, wealth, and prosperity, but everything has just gone the opposite way and it's not come to fruition because you're wrong. So he took a text from the book of Daniel, which is happening during this time of the exile as well, and he takes a verse that he doesn't even mention Nebuchadnezzar about, and it talks about how in uh, Daniel 5, I believe it is, that Nebuchadnezzar thought so much of himself, and so they cut down him in this dream God gives to him. He's a tree, and God cuts him down. He throws him to the ground. He puts a band of iron around the tree stump, and he says, let the grass grow. And so this guy interpreted it as, whatever you have remaining, put a band around it to make it pretty and landscape it with grass. Do you see how absurd that is? That's where Jerusalem now is. God, this is what God does. He humbles us in our vanity. He humbles us in our pride. He doesn't say to you, well, well just because God's cut you down and left, that's all he's left for you, you know, make the most of it at this point. And I want you to see Nehemiah is not that kind of a father. Nehemiah is not that kind of a man. Because when Nehemiah hears of what's taken place, I want you to see he just doesn't try to make the best of what remains and what is left over. But he comes before a holy God and he falls before him and prays. I want you to notice for days he does this. He weeps and he mourns. He continues in fasting. He prays, it says here in verse 4, before the God of heaven. And I want you to see this prayer. If we could put the, this breakdown that I have of this uh, of prayer, I want you to see five things that are helpful to him in doing this. Because there's things here for us to emulate as we come to these points of our brokenness before God. Of when we see the tragedies. Now, remember from last time, Ezra, what took place. Ezra had set his heart to teach the law. He had set his heart to study it. He had set his heart to do it. 
And then he was teaching the statutes and, and, and laws of the Lord. And the result of it, as we saw last week, was is that the people became very conscientiously aware that their sin of, a, of taking foreign women to be their wives, because there are no women, was wrong and sinful. And they had not come and converted to worship Yahweh, but they had been taking their hearts and pulling them away. And so they came and confessed their sins before the Lord. I want you to see this pattern that Ezra and Nehemiah are both doing because they're helpful to us. Ezra and Nehemiah don't point their fingers out at, at the people and say, you have done this, you did this. What they do is they cry out on behalf of, with them, they, they even see their fault in their sinful state. And what does Ezra do? He prays on behalf of the people. And he prays on behalf of their wickedness, knowing that there's even priests and Levites who have done this wicked thing. And their only re recourse in Ezra 9 and 10, as we saw last week, was to repent. Here we see Nehemiah now seeing the, these problems. And I want you to point out, Nehemiah, you could probably say the same thing or, or nearly about Ezra as you did about Nehemiah. Because I want you to see at the very end of this chapter that Nehemiah was just an ordinary person put in a very extraordinary role. He's the cupbearer to the king. Now what that means is this. Essentially, there were people that were the enemy of whoever was the king of the kingdom. And one of the easiest ways to get rid of the king of the kingdom was to attack them with their drink, with their food, and poison it. So the cupbearer was one that would not only, as we think of them, taste it before they gave it and tested it, and if the cupbearer didn't fi fall over, then the king would drink it. This is someone, though, that has so much more than this. You could call him the bartender of the king if you want. This guy is in charge of the winery. He's in charge of everything. He's just not taking the cup immediately here and saying, hmm, let me taste it and see what it's like. He's in charge of this whole area. He's a person that has been entrusted with a huge role for the protection of the king. This could, you could call Nehemiah, he's in the secret service, if you will, of the king. His life depends upon it. And yet at the same time, He's a man, I think, that much like Ezra, has set his heart to know the law, to do it, and to teach its statutes. I want you to see this pattern throughout Scripture. I want you to see that it's just ordinary people. It's not necessarily people that have been set apart. But here's Nehemiah. He knows what God's calling is upon him. He knows the word. And we'll see this when we come to his prayer that he knows the book of Deuteronomy because he takes pieces of Deuteronomy and brings them together and says, these are the things that you have done. You have judged us because of what you said in Deuteronomy. And I want you to also remember the promises, though, that you made that when we repent and return, that you will restore us. Even if we are scattered to the heavens, you will bring us back to the place because of your name. It's an encouragement to us to be people of the Word. Christians have been known throughout history as people of the book. We've lost that today. We need to know our, our, our story. This Old Testament, we need to say, it is not just about the Jewish people. This is not just about what happened before Jesus. We need to see, now that I have been grafted into this tree... This is my identity, and I need to know this because when I know this, I then know who I am as a child of God. And Nehemiah is one of those to be an example to us. And I want you to see this morning the example of what he does when hardships are made known to him. He comes and he weeps and mourns. He fasts and goes without food. He humbles himself. He is laid out before God. He's praying before the God of heaven for days. And in verse number five, I want you to see these five aspects to his prayer. Number one, what we call an invocation. An invocation. When I first came to Valley View 19 years ago, 
The person that was in charge of the community center at the time was an avowed atheist. He had no desire whatsoever for there to be any form of religion in any of our celebrations in Valley View, if truth be known. And yet he knew that as I was a new pastor in town, that I was going to be the person that would give the Memorial Day prayer. And so as easy as he could, without attacking any form of religion, he basically said, you do know what an invocation is and how it's different from a prayer. Actually, I was 28 years old, and I had to go back to the dictionary really quickly when I got home. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> oh, those were years ago. An invocation is calling out on behalf of the people of God and invoking his presence. It doesn't have to end there. It is a joy to pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, every Memorial Day. But I want you to see, it seems as though God has turned his face and has only taken his fiery torches and has blazed Jerusalem and it lays bare. Do you think he wants to talk to a man like Nehemiah? Do you see how important it is? Look at verse number 5, what he does. And he, I said, O Lord God of heaven, I want you to see I want you to see how he approaches him. The great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. You see what he's doing here? He's crying out to the God of the heavens, the great and awesome God, and he reminds him. I love this because it is such an example to us. God, you are the God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with your people. I'm crying out to you on behalf of them. He doesn't come wishy-washy. He comes as a person knowing who God is, and he cries out uh, to him. And then in verse number 6, we begin to see that he makes a petition to God. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which we have sinned against you. Oh God, would you hear? I'm coming before you. Would you hear as I talk to you? Let your eyes be open. Let your ears be attentive to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray day and night. This is not just a one time. This is something that he's crying out continually for, just like we see in Psalm 1. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And now he's practicing it, not in the joyful time, but in the time of great derision. And he cries out, O God, hear. O God, listen. The end of verse 6 and 7, he then speaks of the sins of the people. And he's very clearly pointed with it. He doesn't just say, look at what they did, and now we're in trouble, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Look what he says at the end of verse 6. Even I and my father's house have sinned. Now he gets very clear. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. And so he now says, the things that we have been given by Moses, the books of the law, we have spurned, we have not listened to, we have not upheld them, and we confess it before you. Now he doesn't stop there. Confession is not just to the point of, Lord, just hear our prayer and forgive us our sins. But now I want you to see the anticipation of transformation. This anticipates Jesus Christ, that he changes and transforms us. Aren't you glad for a God who is patient with you and with me? He's a God that does not delight 
in remembering our iniquities. I want to encourage you to know the Psalms. In Psalm 103, I want to point out one Psalm verse to you in Psalm 103 this morning. Psalm 103. Verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. He does not deal with us according to our sins. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. You could read the rest of the psalm and it would apply as well. But basically what the psalmist is saying is, listen God, you are not a God that is tit for tat as I do this and you have to come in the long side of and you just squash me and you punish me and I'm constantly feeling you. If that is our view of God, we have the wrong view of God. We have a very limited, we have a defective view of God. God is patient and merciful. We need to be patient and merciful. He admits their sin. But now the thing is, is that the reason that He doesn't punish us like this is because He's in the process of bringing restoration. And notice this petition that He has in verse number 8. Verse number 8, He cries out, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. Now he's quoting Deuteronomy. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. God, keep your promises. And this is your promise. As we turn to you, as we have been taken from our land as our city lies in ruins as the gates are burned there is nothing of us restore us there is a cry then on behalf of the people around them they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand O lord let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and in the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today. That word success there is the same word in Psalm 1 where it says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law He meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit and its seeds, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever He does, the ESV puts it this way, prospers, or we could use the word succeeds. Do you see here now, here's, a, here's an application by a man like Nehemiah, not in a health, wealth, and prosperity time, not a time of, of goodness. This is a time of desperation. And he cries out and says, your law is still good. Your law is still powerful. Your law is effective. And your promises are forevermore. And I cry out to you. Hear my prayer. Heal my people. I love Nehemiah because he has totally gained a captured view of God. And as he has gained a view of God and who he is, the result is he has been freed from even any form of adoration of self, any look of himself as being important. He has come to the place where he recognizes, God, you must, I cannot. You must Fulfill your promises. I cannot do it. And he cries out then on behalf of the people around us. Of people around him. I jump to application because I would say that if we are to emulate this example that we are given here, and what an example to see. We see it in Jesus himself. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It was not even in the midst of his pain and anguish, the people that put the nails through his hands, that put sour juice to his lips. 
he remembered. I challenge us that we would have a heart to pray for one another. Our heads being so filled with the Word of God, knowing Him, our hearts being so filled with His Word, that it would cause us when we see the wickedness and moral depravity of the world around us, whether it is in our families, inside the church, whether it is in our communities around us, that we would not just overlook it and say that these things are okay, but that we would cry out before a holy God and say, Oh God, we have strayed from You and we must know you and be forgiven so I encourage us call upon the name of the Lord remind God that he hears those who cry out to him we confess our sins fully before him and we come and bring his promises and we petition him with his promises and we intercede on behalf I have titled this sermon this morning, For Such a Time as This. That doesn't fit in this context, one would think at least at first. If you're familiar with that phrase, you say, you've stolen from another story at this time called Esther. A book that was written, as we saw, during the time of Ahasuerus, in this kingdom, and there was this woman who had been placed and exiled as well. The king wanted to have a new wife. She was promenaded before him, and God took and made Esther the queen to save her people alive. She, much like Nehemiah, told the people, would you pray with me for three days that the king would be merciful and would hear for such a time as this? What is a cupbearer going to do about this? He's in charge of the winery. He's not in charge of the army. He's not in charge of the finances of the king. He just watches over what the king drinks. But here's the thing. God takes those who he's put in place and he says, if you will seek me with all your heart, if you will set your heart to know me and to do it, I will bless it. You see, it's not in saying, well, you know, God's cut me down and all I have left is this stump and so I'm going to put a band around it make it look really cool, man. kind of looks like a tattoo around this tree and then I'm going to just take and get some expensive grass and put it down around it and make it as pretty as you can. That's missing the point. The point here is, is that they've fallen before a holy God and said, oh God, we have erred, we have sinned. Would you restore us? God says, yes. I will bless. Yes, I remember my promises. Yes, there is a deliverer who still has to come. And he will come regardless. And God takes a cupbearer, as we'll see next week, to send a crew to rebuild the walls. How do you like to go from the kitchen to construction? That's what takes place. God uses those who will entrust themselves and call upon His mercies and His promises. I want to challenge us as we have the musicians come forward this morning. We might live ignorantly today in our day and age and think that everything is just going to be all right. Or we might see that the writing is on the wall. It depends on how we look at the world around us. But regardless of it all, is how will we respond in the days that we have been given? Nehemiah didn't ask to be born at this time. Esther did not ask to be born at the time she was nor did Daniel, nor did anyone else. 
None of us have that control. It's not about have we been born at the right time. It's a matter of saying there's a God who is all-powerful and sovereign who has placed me at the time that he has. And what he's called me to do is not worry about if this is the golden age when everything is great or if this is a time of misery when the walls are destroyed. But what he calls us to do is to say this, God, will I serve you in the times as this that you've placed me? Will I be faithful in following you? That's what God is desiring of you and me. We're in times of leanness, I think, personally. Where God's word is not heeded. Where everything else is exalted in place of God. And yet we have the privilege to shine like, it says in the book of Daniel, like stars in a dark sky. So let's shine. Amen? Let's be people that say, God, I will come before the King. I will humble myself before the King of Kings first. And I will pray. God, keep your promises. God, fulfill your word. Let's sing to him. Would you stand?